So Destiny sat down for a debate with Jordan Peterson, and goddamn, goddamn. I mean, first of all, as somebody who has talked to Peterson before, it's kind of like a tornado hits you when you talk to him. Like, it's very difficult. You have to pick your spots, when to respond, how to respond, because you know his default mode is like dominating the conversation and talking the overwhelming majority of the time. Now, in this instance, it's like Peterson is supposed to be interviewing Destiny. So in theory, the floor is kind of open for him to go where he wants and take some time giving his answers. But in reality, I mean, I don't know. Somebody should crunch the numbers and uh, figure out like what percentage of the time they both talked because he talked. He seemingly talked a lot. And like I said, it's like a tornado is hitting you when you're talking to him. Um, what's interesting about this debate is that, like, I think they're very similar in some ways. Like, both Destiny and Jordan Peterson, they're, they're very, very confident when they talk. Um, and they like to flesh out their points and, like, take a little while explaining why they feel as they feel. Uh, I'd say Destiny talks a little faster than Jordan Peterson does, but they give off a similar vibe from my perspective. Like, the way they communicate, it gives off a very similar vibe. So I know going into it, oh boy, this could be interesting, because they could really, really clash in areas where they disagree. And they did not disappoint. So look, for purposes of this uh, segment I'm doing now, I'm not going to get into every part that I found interesting, because we'd just be here forever. For example, I'm leaving on the cutting room floor the whole part on the mRNA vaccines. I think that was probably... Destiny's strongest uh, point in the debate because, I mean, look, Jordan Peterson is just drunk on, like, the massive misinformation that floats around social media about the mRNA vaccines. He kept moving the goalposts where at first he was like, you know, the problem is that they tried to use force to make you take it. That was his first, uh, his starting position, which is reasonable enough, right? That's not an extremist take. That's a very common take. But then, like, when pushed, he moves the goalpost to... And what do you think of the excess deaths or a lot of excess deaths? Where do they come from? And he tried to imply that it's because of the vaccine. And then when Destiny would push him on it, he would back off. And I didn't say that. But then you go on to like imply it again. And he's full like conspiracy brain. You know, all the the nonstop misinformation you see everywhere about the vaccine. He's, he's fully drunk on that. But I think Destiny knew enough about that topic where he was really able to deconstruct what Peterson was saying. And he came across looking much, much better. Um... So that's one por uh, portion. I don't know. I think we are going to get into the climate change thing. We're showing like a couple parts here, but I could have done a much, much longer segment on this. I just don't want to be here all day. So um, let's start with this one. This is a moment that went viral when... <sighs> Listen to what Peterson says about the Nazis and Hitler. It's because Hitler's lack of trying led him to kill us people then, what, who ended up dying during the Great Leap Forward or during the industrialization of the Yes, well, I also think it's an open question still to what degree Hitler's policies were right-wing versus left-wing, and no one's done the analysis properly yet to determine that. Well, what do we consider? Because it was a national socialist movement for a reason, and the socialist part of it wasn't accidental. He has full Daily Wire brainworms at this point. I mean, that's the only <laughs> straightforward interpretation from what he said there. He's been at the Daily Wire too long. He has full right-wing brain worms. He's fully immersed in the Ben Shapiro world. And he's now gone. This was Steven Crowder's point he makes every couple of years. Like, actually, Hitler was a left-wing, bro. And it's like, come on, man. Come on. This is like when uh, somebody on the left says, actually, Stalin was a right-winger. It's like, you know, somebody can have the ideo uh, an ideology that is similar to yours, but then also do horrific atrocities, right? And in the case of Stalin, yeah, he was a communist. And economically, he may have been more in favor of redistribution, but he was also a massive authoritarian and killed large numbers of people, right? Like, you can admit that. You could say he's both left-wing and genocide. You can say that. And by the same token, for Hitler, of course he's right-wing and genocidal. But he's trying to do the thing where it's like, 
all right wingers are we must protect them to one extent or another because all the bad comes from the left that's what it is and i don't think redistribution was high on hitler's list of that's things true to do for, that's yeah. true it was but a I strange that, mix of, sure. of well, totalitarian policy i don't think it was a strange mix i think it was a bid to appeal to uh mid-left and center left the kpd and the german socialist party by calling themselves national socialists i think it was very much like an authoritarian ultra-nationalist regime that pretty squarely fits with uh, people get mad if you call something far right or far left because they have a, an, an well you know terms, one of but, the things i would have done mm-hmm. if i would have been able to hang on to my professorship at the University of Toronto would have been to ax- extract out a random sample of Nazi policies and strip them of, of markers of their origin and present them to a set of people with conservative or, or leftist beliefs and see who agreed with them more. And that analysis has never been done as far as I know. So we actually don't know. And uh, we could know uh, if the social scientists would do their bloody job, which yeah. they don't, generally speaking. That's something we could know. We could probably use the AI systems we have now, the large language models, to determine to what degree left and right beliefs intermingled in the rise of national socialism. We're going to use AI to determine whether or not Hitler was right wing. We might get some surprising results. (laughs) Come on, man. Come on. Look, the response to this is very simple. The, like, the core of Hitler's ideology is not like, hey, man. He built some highways, bro. And those highways were pretty good. That's kind of lefty, right? The core of his ideology is not like the infrastructure. (laughs) The the core of his ideology, you know, kind of the operative thing, the main problem is the rigid, rigid sense of hierarchy and racism and eugenics and mass extermination campaigns for Jews for disabled people, for gay people. He obviously despised communists as well. That's very well known about Hitler. So the real operative part of his ideology is sort of like, we have to keep the bloodlines pure and we have to keep our rigid hierarchy in place with me as the Fuhrer on top. And we have to do our mass extermination campaign of the undesirables. Like when people talk about Hitler's ideology, that's kind of the main point of it. And there is nothing even remotely left-wing about it. Yeah, roads, bridges, highways. Almost every leader (laughs) is like, I'm pro roads, bridges, and highways. Does that mean it's the operative part of their ideology? No. Are we really having this debate in 2024 about whether or not Hitler was right-wing or left-wing? Really? God. We're going to use AI to determine whether or not whether or not Hitler was left wing might be very surprising. I'm going to do a study on it. <laughs> Come on, man. By the way, somebody uh, tweeted this. This is this Jordan Peterson lived this meme. Far left, the Nazis were right wing. Center left, the Nazis were right wing. Center, the Nazis were right wing. Right wing. Center right. No, they're left wing. Look at the name. Far right, we are right wing. <laughs> oh, man. All right, I got more for you. So this part is uh, on climate change. Buckle up for this one. I'm talking about the record temperatures that are declared, that have been declared for like the past five years that have also increased with the uh, with the concentration of parts per million of carbon dioxide of the atmosphere. Um, I mean, I'm not going to tell you that every model is perfect. They're but not right perfect. Now, sure. But right now we're like standing in traffic with our eyes closed saying the car hasn't hit me yet. So I don't think there's any coming. I think it's pretty undeniable at this point that there is an impact on climate across the planet. I, I think know. that's highly deniable. We have no idea what the impact is from. We don't know where the carbon dioxide is from. We can't measure the warming of the oceans. We have terrible temperature records going back 100 years. Almost all the terrestrial temp- Okay, just so you know, I shouldn't even have to do this interjection. That's not true. <laughs> like it's, he's, he's just wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, 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 detection sites were first put outside urban areas and then as and then the, right and then you have to warm. correct then you have to correct for the for the movement of the urban areas he's very well versed in the whole range of literature that are people funded by the oil industry trying to obfuscate the reality of climate change yeah it's true you can find 1% of climate scientists who are like, actually, I think it's a crock of BS and climate change isn't happening. And if it, even if it is happening, it's not man-made. You could find somebody to say that. But you dig a little deeper into their background. And we've, we've done this on this channel. We've gone through it. There's this one guy, forget his name, but he was uh, with the Heartland Institute. Like, the same group that had 
tobacco industry funded scientists who went in front of Congress and said, cigarettes don't cause cancer. We have the science to show that. That same group was then funding scientists, like scientists for hire, mercenary scientists to come out and say, that's not, there's a doubt about climate change and if it's happening and if people are, are responsible for it. So there, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of convincing sounding arguments you can make to try to build that case to work backwards from your conclusion that climate change isn't happening and it's not man-made. But it's all, like, mucked up by the fossil fuel industry trying to come up with any argument or reason to drag our feet and not address climate change. And he's very well-versed. Because I he had that guy on his podcast, Jordan Peterson did a while ago. Like, the guy I'm talking about who's, like, funded by the fossil fuel industry and gives all the climate science denial talking points. Produce an error parameter that's larger than the purported increase in temperature that you're planning to measure. This isn't data, this is guess. And there's something weird underneath it. Mm. There's something weird that isn't oriented well towards human beings underneath it. It has this guise of compassion. Oh, we're gonna save the poor in the future. It's like, that's what the bloody communists said. And they killed a lot of people doing it. And we're walking down that same road now with this insistence that, you know, we're so compassionate that we care about the poor a hundred years from now. And if we have to wipe out several hundred million of them now, well, that's a small price to pay for the future utopia. By the way, this argument he's making right here is the core of what Destiny objects to about him throughout the debate. That Jordan Peterson sort of always gets right up to that line of implying or just flat out saying that there's a nefarious group of global elites who almost are like purposefully trying to destroy humanity and civilization and drag us backwards and do the depopulation stuff. It actually sounds, it's very Alex Jones-ish, right? Like, by the way, don't get it twisted. I think that multinational corporations and billionaires are have sort of like an open conspiracy. We care first and foremost about profit. We try to effectively buy off governments to rig policies in our favor so you don't care as much about the environment or the working class or whatever. I think there's an open conspiracy where billionaires and multinational corporations care first and foremost about profit and say sort of screw everything else, throw it by the wayside type stuff. He goes a step further. It is very like Alex Jonesy and it's very uh, like there's this shadowy group of ill-meaning nefarious communists in his instance is what he thinks it is. And they're like, they're doing all these things on purpose and they're trying to destroy civilization. And that's the core of what Destiny objects to, because he's like, you, you always take it too far and you act like it's nefarious intentions from nefarious people and they're actively lying about climate change and it's they're all in on it. And that's like, that is super conspiracy brain. And that's very like poisoned by the internet type brain, right? I've heard that sort of thing before. And the alternative to that is for is to stop having global level elites plot out a utopian future or even an anti-dystopian future. And that's exactly what's happening now with organizations like the WEF. It's adorable that he thinks global elites are trying to plot a utopian future. <laughs> it is adorable that he thinks that. No, global elites are in the business of a status quo protection racket. Because this is the system that they are incredibly wealthy and powerful. They want to protect that system. They're not trying to create some sort of global utopia. <laughs> I mean, that's insane. It's insane. He's wrong. He gets it exactly wrong. It's the exact opposite of the truth. Okay. Anyway, I got one more for you. I have to share this with you. Go watch the whole debate, by the way. Uh, it's definitely worth watching the whole thing. Again, I could have done like seven different segments on this, but I'm going to limit myself to this. This is, this is one of the moments that uh, people are getting the biggest kick out of. Uh, I don't think you can compare like Hitler to people that are worried about climate change. The worry that I Why have here not? is... <laughs> Look, as Jordan Peterson has been in the public eye for as long as he has been now, and as time has gone by, he sort of dropped the whole guise of, like, the wise professor just trying to give you life advice to make you more successful and happy, right? That was his whole thing. Clean your room. Here are the 12 rules for life. Let me be a psychologist first and give just, like, practical life advice and mix it in with a dash of philosophy and... Here's what this psychologist said, and here's why this is profound. That was a lot of what he was doing early on, and then over time, it's just been f going further and further and further right. 
to now he's, of course, on the Daily Wire. He has Daily Wire brain. He's a very ardent conservative now, mixed in with a healthy dose of conspiracy theory type beliefs to the point where he's talking to Destiny and Destiny's like, I don't think you can compare people who believe in climate science to Hitler. And he's just like, why not? Because that's insane. Because then you're comparing the majority, certainly of the American people, probably the majority of the global population. I've never seen a poll globally on climate change, but I'm assuming the majority of people, it's similar to the U.S. and that the majority of people think climate change is real. You're saying they're all like Hitler? Or have they been duped by this Nazi-esque ideology of caring about the environment and trying to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels? Come on, man. It's just so goofy. So look, we'll end on this point. I don't even know why I'm bothering to do this, but nonetheless, here I go. This is some nerd type stuff to even sincerely respond to it. But look, a lot of people like Jordan Peterson, right? A lot of people listen to him. A lot of people like him. Maybe they're unfamiliar with the actual, uh, you know, academic evidence on this. But uh, this was an article from two years ago. Case closed. 99.9% .9 of scientists agree climate emergency caused by humans. So it's actually, the headline uh, sells it short. It's not 99.9% .9 of scientists agree. It is 99.9% .9 of the credible peer-reviewed studies on this agree. That's way stronger than just saying the, clim the, the scientists agree. Trawl of 90,000 studies finds consensus leading to call for Facebook and Twitter to curb disinformation. Now that part I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that part. I'm a believer in free speech, even if the speech is hideously incorrect. But let's jump into this. The scientific consensus that humans are altering the climate has passed 99.9% .9 according to research that strengthens the case for global action at the COP26 summit in Glasgow. The degree of scientific certainty about the impact of greenhouse gases is now similar to the level of agreement on evolution and plate tectonics, the authors say, based on a survey of nearly 90,000 climate-related studies. This means there is practically no doubt among experts that burning fossil fuels such as oil, gas, coal, peat, and trees is heating the planet and causing more extreme weather. A previous survey in 2013 showed 97% of studies published between 1991 and 2012 supported the idea that human activities are altering Earth's climate. This has been updated and expanded by the, uh, by the study by Cornell that shows the tiny minority of skeptical voices has diminished to almost nothing as evidence mounts of the link between fossil fuel burning and climate disruption. The latest survey of peer-reviewed literature published from 2012 to November 2020 was conducted in two stages. First, the researchers examined a random sample of 3,000 studies in which they found... in which they found, they only found four papers that were skeptical. Out of 30,000, only four were skeptical that the climate crisis was caused by humans. Second, they searched the full database of 88,125 studies for keywords linked to climate skepticism, such as natural cycles and cosmic rays, which yielded 28 papers, all published in minor journals. The authors said their study published on Tuesday in the journal Environmental Research Letters shows skepticism among experts is now vanishingly small. Look, this is what the actual data shows. This is what it shows. And so... To be denying it at this point is just wrong. Now, but here's the thing, right? He would take one look at this and find a reason to dismiss what's this is called a meta-analysis. It's an amalgamation of all the credible studies on it. He would still find a way to dismiss this, and he would attack it at the source, and he would say, I don't believe your data. I think your data is fake. I think your data is wrong. I think your data has a bunch of assumptions that are incorrect. This is effectively what he would say. And at that point, look, you just got to walk away, right? Because... If you can't agree on the underlying facts, then of course you're not going to agree on the solutions. You could try to get Peterson, if you say to Peterson, let's assume for argument's sake, this is correct about climate change. Would you then agree with program A, B, or C to wean us off of fossil fuels to bring about more renewable technology, etc., right? You could ask that, but the fact of the matter is, as long as he attacks the data, attacks the study, just like right at the ground level there, you know, cut it out from the roots. As long as he does that, he's never going to agree, right? So in a sense, it's almost like a conversation about something like this with Jordan Peterson is not, is worthless. Because if he's going to disagree from the premise, if he's going to disagree from the roots of the conversation, if he's going to disagree on the data and the facts, which then you can then build conclusions off of, then we're, we're, we're stuck nowhere, right? We're not going to get anywhere. And unfortunately, that's what it's like discussing a lot of different things with him. Um, it's not easy. To, to talk with that guy. I know I debated him on trans stuff, among other things. You guys have seen the clip, I'm sure. Um, it's hard to get a word in edgewise and get your point across, and he usually dominates the conversation. But I think Destin did a pretty good job, certainly on the vaccine portion of it and some other portions of it. Go check it out. And it seemed like they kind of liked each other. They had, they had a little bit of an affinity for each other. Uh, Peterson was sort of heaping praise on him at the end, which I found kind of interesting about, oh, you're a good debater. Oh. 
And so we'll see. They'll probably get together in the future as well. But like I said, watching that thing was like, it's like getting hit by a tornado. <laughs> Your head spinning as, as they keep going. It, it got pretty intense. All right, guys, that's the show. I love you all very much. Everybody do me a favor. Subscribe to the channel. Helps out massively. Click that bell icon so you get a notification every single time a video drops. Like the video, comment, all that fun stuff. Thank you to everybody who supports the show on Patreon. If you'd like to, that link is below. Thank you everybody who tips on YouTube with the thanks button. That, that's as below as well if you'd like to help out. All right, love you guys. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.